Okay, I've got a set of questions that came from the chat, uh, but I'm gonna try to answer some of them, which are, and you know, some of them might not be answerable or I might not know the answer, but uh, I'm gonna discuss them with you to the best of my ability, and you're gonna write in the comments uh, and help people who come back and watch this video later um, to see other uh, thoughts and perspectives and answers here. Okay, so first question here is how, uh, from Nick, and I, I'm, comp I'm combining and rewording some of these questions, so uh, Nick asks, how flexible are the engines and how easily can you integrate them with code? Um, and related to that, Jonathan asks, are there abstract uses of maybe using these physics engines you know, without even computer graphics and drawing simulation. If we come back over here, and I think, you know, in some ways there's a different answer for a lot of these uh, questions. One thing that makes Box2D difficult to work with is Box2D is actually, in many ways, it's sort of a silly word to use, but a very pure physics engine. It knows nothing about computer graphics and pixels, and its units of measurements are actually meters, seconds, real world measurements. Now it's there's some nuance to this because it's sort of finely tuned for small units of measurements. Um, but, but that aside, when you actually do this process of saying where all the things are, you have to give Box2D a set of locations in, um, with physical measurements as if it's in a real physical space. And Box2D will tell you where the stuff is at a moment in time and you have to convert that back to a pixel space. So in that sense, it's incredibly flexible because it, it's abstracted from computer graphics at all, and you could actually use it in the program and never draw anything, and kind of use it to simulate some aspects of things. It makes it kind of difficult to work with, but um, because you have to do all this conversion and thinking, and it makes it more complex than, say, Matter.js or Toxiclibs, where you can just give the engine pixel-based coordinates, and it gives you back pixel-based coordinates, but um, it does give it a sort of level of sophistication and perhaps even accuracy, you could maybe say, I mean, you know, I'm not expert enough in the, the lower level mechanics of all these engines to really say which one's more accurate than the other, but, um, but that certainly is an aspect of this uh, uh, for sure. Okay, let me come back and see what the next question is. Uh, FlipkidMC asks, can you use multiple engines at once? You absolutely could. <laughs> I think you're probably asking for trouble in some ways. I mean, I'm sure there are some very unique, interesting situations where that makes sense, but there's enough time and overhead in sort of learning well, it's certainly worth learning multiple physics engines, but you know, there's enough uh, specificity to what are the objects that are available, what are the names of all the functions, and there's, you know, each physics engine probably has its own vector object, and you, know, you can't give Box2D a vector from Toxiclibs, and you can't give Toxiclibs a vector from Box2D, so you're gonna have to be converting. So I'm not so sure that you would really want to do that, but you, again, this is, anything is possible because you are the designer of the system and you are the drawer of the, the you are the person rendering the world. So you could give the information to multiple physics engines and, and try to like get stuff out and send it back, you know, input it back into the other ones and do some kind of crazy convoluted thing, but I'm not so sure. One thing I should mention <laughs> is that you don't actually have to do this necessarily. Matter.js and, um, for example, I know very specifically has a kind of automatic debug view. So you can just say to Matter, here's a canvas. Draw where everything is on the canvas. And it behind the scenes in its code has the ability to do that. But my point of view in showing you these things is really to focus on how you draw the stuff yourself because that's where you can really layer in your own design sensibility. And that's kind of one of the questions here. Um, I'm going out of order here, but uh, Albert asked, like, can you use shaders and how can you really put your own design? It really, that's a really key aspect of being creative and working with physics engines and, cre and making something that's not just looking like a demo. <laughs> so all of my examples are demos because I'm taking, I'm taking the physics uh, engine and kind of drawing l the literal pieces of it on the screen in kind of um, literal way. I'm overusing the word literal. <laughs> but um, but I, I'm just saying what's in the physics engine, let me draw uh, exactly what's in the physics engine as sort of simple geometric shapes. Whereas there's no reason why you couldn't make fuzzy textures and blend modes and do all of your creative drawing using the coordinate and geometry information that's coming out of the engine. Okay, what else do, what am else, what else do I got here on this uh, question? So uh, this, this, performance considerations is absolutely a big one. So one of the nice things about using a physics engine is that, you know, assuming it's something that's worked on by a lot of people over a long period of time, uh, you know, 
all the ones that I'm talking about are open source engines that are, uh, most of them, the source code is on GitHub and have a wide variety of contributors. <laughs> but probably, for you know, people have been working for years on optimizing them. So in, in many ways, it's going to be more efficient and have higher performance than what you might throw together in a day. That said, these types of computations are expensive. To look at every object in a system and, wh and where, how it's colliding with every other object and it's going to have some kind of complex polygon geometry. So, you know, there certainly is a slowness here, but, you know, Box2D is very efficient, runs very fast, especially if you're in C++, but it's going to run a lot slower in the canvas and the browser, drawing is slower. So, you know, yes, there are performance considerations. You know, could I sit here and like talk about them for, I'm like asking myself questions now. I, the answer to that is no. Like I, I'm, that, that I think merits a kind of a lot of trial and error and, and digging into the source code and seeing where, how things work best. Okay. Um, Nick does not deserve credit for the first question. So I don't know who, who asked that question. It was a great question, but it was not by Nick. Thank you. Uh, and um, let's see. Um, do some simulate more accurately than others? That's, you know, that's another consideration here. There's usually often a trade-off, right? It's going to be slower if it's more accurate. <laughs> it's going to be faster if it's less accurate. Uh, apparently that question is from Ga Gabriel, perhaps. Um, and uh, can you, okay, another question here is uh, from Philippe, how to use, for, and this is, uh, I reworded this question, but how to use forces with physics engine and can you control velocity? So this is a big question, which I will cover and look at in a lot of my examples. But the question really is, I kind of set you up in this way of like, hey, let's put stuff in the world. It's in the world. Now let's go over here. Let's read where the stuff is and let's draw it to the screen. But what if the thing that's in the world, I want to control how it's moving, or I want to like add a force into the world that's going to affect the way that the world is behaving. So most of the physics engines are going to have a mechanic for this. For example, the body object, you create this body object, you put it in the world, you can keep a reference to that body object, and later you might be able to call a function called like add force or apply force to cause the body to experience maybe a sudden gust of wind, for example. There's another, uh, there's a question though, it's like, well, what if you want to affect these, not with a force, but by actually saying, hey, I want this object's velocity to be this. And yes, physics engines will let you do that because, you know, number one is you can just kind of dig into the source code. They're gonna, body's gonna have a variable in it somewhere that's like the velocity, you could set it. But you have to watch out, the big problem here, it's very easy to violate the laws of physics in a, with a physics engine. It's kind of hard to do that, although I would love, that's a good, like, real world challenge, let's violate the laws of physics. I'm sure that would be an exciting YouTube video, I'd get lots of views. But we can easily violate the laws of physics. For example, what if I just take an object that's in the world and I say, hey, you know its position is over here? Now set its position to over here. I can actually do that and it's gonna appear over there. But I, what I've essentially just done is I've teleported it, which violates the laws of physics you know, at least in terms of physics engine. <laughs> um, and so in that case, you might start to see some strange behavior. But if I wanted to move something around manually uh, through an interaction without teleporting it to cause some strange behavior, what I might be able to do is attach a connection. Maybe I attach a connection to the object and I connect it also to my mouse and then I move the mouse around and I'm tugging it around, almost like I've attached a string to something and moving it. So that's a way, that's one strategy for um, moving something around through a, you know, a Perlin noise algorithm or through user interaction by uh, still staying within the sort of laws of physics of that world. It depends on how the physics engine works, but this is certainly a common problem. And another, it's, that wasn't really a question I added to my list. Another very common thing about physics engine is, oh, it's doing all this collision stuff for me. That's great. Yay, I don't have to do the collision stuff. But what I really want is when they collide, I want to bing, play a note of music or something. So if you want to do that, you have to know when the things collide. <laughs> and that's happening in here. How do you know when it collides? Well, you could say, okay, well, what I'm going to start to do is I'm going to look at all the things. I'm going to look at where they are in relation to each other. And when they're, when they're within a certain distance, they must be colliding. But then if you go down that road of thinking, <laughs> you've completely defeated the whole purpose of using the physics engine. You're starting to re-implement those collision algorithms yourself. So most physics engines will have this idea of a collision listener. So you can write a callback function or some, uh, create some type of object that sits there and tells you information about, hey, there's been an event, these two things collided, here's object one, here's object two, here's their properties, you know, what are you going to do about it? So like, oh, if it's a purple object with a red object, it plays you know, C. If it's a, 
a green object with a pink object, it plays the note D. So you can, you, you're going to want to look for something like a listener to be able to also not just extract where the things are that you want to draw, but to extract moments in time that are certain events, like collision events, that you want to handle in a certain way. Okay, so I, I don't, this is like a ridiculously long intro to physics engines tutorial video that I can't imagine. <laughs> anybody really wanted to watch. But if you're still here, thank you for watching. And uh, I think the, the other videos in this particular playlist will have much more information and actual code about how to do these things and how they work. Um, so I hope you watch them and I hope you enjoy them. And I'm sure, I, I, and I hope you leave me some comments with some feedback. Okay, thanks very much and I'll see you soon.